you've already had fiscal deficit as an optical number at 5%. Capital investment isn't really taking place. So is it going to be something that has to happen on the consumption side uh, with maybe personal income taxes or perhaps even taxing something like agricultural income, which is something that people don't talk about having certain thresholds? What specific fiscal steps are we talking about? Especially in the context, I mean, if, if, you, if you view the political landscape in the country today and you spoke about the center not uh, giving the funds to the states. Well, not the no, I think the question is, what do you want personal income taxes cut? What's yeah, the way I to mean, bump up consumption? When you say fiscal expansion, are you talking about more government spending, no, no, incentives on, on income taxes perhaps? What can sort of revive the consumption part of the economy? No, but the first point is just to admit there's a, there's a, there's a issue right now is just to admit that the fiscal deficit this year is going to be much bigger than what the, the target is. That's the key point right now mm. because that's what's stopping the payments. Yeah, first the admission. Uh, yeah, the, 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 there's all kind. Now, actually, on the corporate tax cut, personally, I applaud it, but from a political standpoint, <coughs> actually, it would have made more sense to say we're going to cut the corporate taxes next fiscal year because that would have had just as good a market impact as cutting them this year, because markets look forward. But by doing it for just this year, you've created an immediate hole which, which causes problem mm. for fiscal squeezing. But actually, anybody knew about markets would say, you don't need to do it for this year. You just need to say you're doing it for next year. Mm. And it would have had just as positive an impact. So that's why understanding markets is, is what's missing in uh, Delhi. Okay. I think Prashant wanted a question. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Chris, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, when you started addressing the question about BPCL and the divestment, you kind of uh, raised a question mark, I thought, uh, didn't quite fully get addressed, but you said that does it make sense to do it to fund a revenue shortfall? Uh, I think. Yes, yeah, because you're selling a strategic asset for, presumably, because you want to privatize. Yeah, that's my question, because the general assumption is that uh, privatization or the kickstart of privatization, BPCL especially, uh, will send a very strong signal to foreign investors. Uh, I mean, you know, that India is open for business and mm. uh, the government is serious to do something which has been considered very difficult over the last two decades. Is that really <coughs> so? I mean, is that going to send that signal? No, def definitely. The, my, my simple point is it's more important to sell it well, do it properly, than rush it. It just seems, mo I mean, look, I'm not an investment banker, but it <laughs> seems to me the deadline of March is an extremely short deadline. We saw how long it's taken this Aramco issue, obviously. I mean, these things take time. But I think, you know, I think it sends a very positive message. Yep. Okay, Chris, I, I have I one question for you. The point is that if you're doing it, do out of conviction, not out of compulsion. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Chris, just one question. Uh, how do you stay so fit? And you're, <laughs> you're barely aged. How do you stay so fit? Oh, no, no comment. <laughs> okay. I'm glad. <laughs> okay, the question I have is, what is the, what is the biggest risk to India? We've all heard about, you know, foreigners wanting to invest in India, but what to your mind is the, is the biggest risk? Now, the big risk from, uh, look, if someone's taking a long-term investment view in India <coughs> and they're, they're investing from outside, their biggest risk is they make money in the equities, but they lose it. Mm. And also, you know, in terms of, you, you said demographics, but the, the gap between the haves and have-nots in India is only increasing, and uh, you know there's been some you know recent cases of, about law and order issues, and it's you know all these. You think they at some point will bother foreign investors? Investors. The foreign investors. See, foreign investors aren't aren't focused on that. They're probably a bit. Frankly, they probably don't know that much about it. Mm. Okay. They'll probably more. Focused, they'll be more focused on that issue in the home markets because that's become more of an issue in the Western world in the last 10 years, whereas that was probably already an issue in India and, and elsewhere in Asia. Isn't money amoral? I mean, otherwise, why would the Americans be investing in Chinese stocks? You that's know right. they are undemocratic. I, I, would you say money is largely amoral? No, I would. I would totally agree, yeah. Chris, a lot of the growth of India has happened more through the services sector mm -hmm. and, and we seem to be talking more about macroeconomics and financial sector stuff and all of that. Uh, but how do you think India's growth is going to be more sustainable, especially like 
I think Ramesh was talking or Manish was talking about going from an emerging market to an emerged market. Do you think all of this is possible without actually now addressing the real structural reforms around land, labor, power sector? I mean, these are, don't you think these probably it's time for India to visit this? This has been the most difficult part of the journey for the last three decades. My, my understanding is this government's doing labor reform. They're talking do, do, about it. I mean, do you think it's still kind of impactful? I mean, is it? Is it? Okay, no, uh, so let me kind of probably no, no, direct it that whatever this government is trying to do, do you think it, is that uh, what ought to be done? Or there's something really more to be done. Is there just lip service, or <coughs> is it something really more big bang? No, no. My understanding is they're actually doing proper labor reform. They're just not making too much noise about it because they don't want to trigger a big political reaction and I would have thought from the trying to get manufacturing into India that's a very important point um, so to me uh, but maybe I'm wrong uh, that's my understanding fine thanks Chris, uh, yeah. the, one of the slides mentioned that the tax reforms led to an increased uh, share buybacks in the US more monies came in more dollars came back into US mm. The tax reforms uh, or the tax cut in India that has, uh, w in your view, would that lead to, uh, you know, increased return to the shareholders or more payout to the shareholders? Would it lead to investments into, uh, you know, investments back into investments or would it lead to payment of money back into the banking channels? Well, I think this U.S. share buyback thing is a very U.S. specific issue because the tax system encourages the corporates to borrow money, not pay dividends. And the executives in the U.S. are remunerated many times on ROE formula. So I think it's a very... But I think the key point on the Indian corporate tax cuts, it basically puts Indian corporate tax rates more in line with the rest of Asia. But so is that good enough to attract foreign investments? If you, if you take into account dividend distribution tax and the corporate tax rate, it's still you, higher. Are you talking equity investment or the direct investment? Direct okay. investment. No, what's much more important for direct investment is, is labor reform and the ability to get land. Far more important than the tax rate, in my opinion. You see India being able to get into the uh, supply chain which China is exiting somewhat? No, I'm, right now, if you said who's going to benefit from investments of going out of China, India is not, not top, no, nor is Indonesia. Who's, in, who's, in, who's getting Vietnam. it is Vietnam, Malaysia, Thailand, and also actually Taiwan. Taiwan's getting to this, this uh, lot, of, lot of productions going back into Taiwan, and these, the bans on the Americans selling to Huawei actually. The stocks that have gone up the most on this theme are not in Vietnam, they're Taiwan tech stocks. Taiwan's the big beneficiary. Krish, uh, I would just add, you know, people have been talking about TARP, you have been talking about auctioning, but as Lata said, like the bank, the NBFC should be willing. So it is allowed. A lot of foreigners have been buying assets from NBFC, but only few NBFCs, the large one, who are proactive in selling. That. So almost I can say in last seven, eight months, uh, three to four billion dollars of assets have been picked up. Oh, by, really? NBA, by, by the foreigners Canadian from the no no a lot of individual uh, FPIs uh, have really picked up a lot of things and there are enough of funds looking at uh, both distress as well as uh, uh, the real estate stressed uh, lending and right now on real estate unlike the manufacturing it's not happening at stress level people are just buying out NBFC's loan at maybe getting the collateralized better. You know, so that's what is happening. So while we, as you said, it's not a big issue, but we are making it, but we are not doing anything to accelerate and solve that much faster. What is that we can really look at it? Because you can't force an NBFC to declare that as, uh, you know, NBA, NPL or maybe force it out to sell. Unless they are willing to sell it out to so maybe what is stopped right now is their growth further. But what is not the growth, NBFC's growth is stuck, uh, uh, stopped. But otherwise, there's no distress sell happening from NBFC. But, but you're talking about the distressed debt funds, which are now ha operating in India. Not only stress funds, even senior secure. So oh. if you look at a lot of uh, real estate loans, which were given by the NBFCs, housing finance companies, mm. has been picked up uh, by the foreign investors. Uh, you know, at maybe 16, 17%, 18%, and maybe improve the collateral value a little bit. And uh, they have been picking it up. So there are enough buyers willing to buy it. So it's not that there are complete distress assets still happening. Well, that's very, well, first of all, that's very helpful. That's very positive. That's happening. 
But what in the, when the U.S. banking problem happened after the savings and loan crisis, what forced that to happen was the banking regulators went in there and just applied very tough criteria. Mm -hmm. So I think, yeah, the, that's, the, that's the way to force that, for the regulators to go in, what they call banking, you know, and uh, basically uh, question the health of the portfolio. Unless you get that regulatory catalyst, it won't happen. We did for the banks. <laughs> yes. AQR, what yeah, you, you just Basically have to <laughs> identify the stressed asset and so then you say you either sell at uh, whatever 50 percent or whatever people are asking for or you provide that much. That's how they did in Dhanaharta. That's how they did in Malaysia. Yeah, that's, what they see, that's what the Japanese did not do for many, <laughs> many years. That's why that problem lingered. Um, that's what, yeah, so. In fact, if you just look at the shadow bank problem in China and the magnitude of that versus what we have in NBFC, HFC, just that we are not bold and creative enough. It's much smaller than what no. several countries in the world have handled. Yeah. No, it's much, I completely agree with that. This, is not, this should not be in any way, shape or form systemic. That makes us bold about uh, buying Indian stocks. Okay, last two questions. Yeah. Uh, just two short questions. One, from an inv investor's point of view, how do you uh, are you positive or negative on the five trillion economy target which the Indian government has it's given by 2024? No comment on that. <laughs> and the second question is, uh, do you think the inflation target or the fiscal uh, deficit target mandate which the uh, both uh, the central bank and the government respectively have, how much of it is an in impediment to addressing the current slowdown? No, I think that uh, though I think they're both short-term impediments because the problem is the market thinks the fiscal deficit's 5%, or nearly, and uh, they're still saying it's going to keep it at 3.3. Mm. On the inflation target, personally, I'm not a huge fan of inflation targeting, but there is an issue of do you target the CPI or the core CPI? And so there seems to be a question mark about that, because my understanding is the RBI targets the headline CPI. Yes. But you could argue they should target they should the core, core CPI. CPI. And 50 percent of that is food. Yeah, yeah, that's why the core CPI is better. Yeah, Shubda, last yeah. question. Just one short question. Uh, do you think this whole process of disinvestment should be hived out from the fiscal math? Would it allow government to think more strategically oh, no, in I, diluting? Yeah, completely. I think that makes total sense because it's, it's, this is a long. This is a, yeah. I think that makes total sense in principle. Okay. Just take the decision, but don't mix it up with the PNL. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Chris, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Uh, you have the, some of the biggest fund managers here and portfolio managers. Uh, they'll probably have more questions for you over coffee. Thank Thanks. you so Thank much you. for being with us and being part of our 20th anniversary celebrations. And a very big thank you to Ramesh, Manish, and uh, Navneet for raising the standard of the d questioning. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, that was a power-packed panel and a lot of heavyweight opinion which we got and we're going to get that through the day as well on our 20th uh, anniversary celebrations. But just want to turn our attention towards the markets because we haven't really spoken about that. The mid-cap index, that seems to be where the problem is in uh, at this point in time because it's down at the low point of the day, down around a percent odd currently for the mid-cap index, down around 150 plus points. Uh, for the Nifty, we've lost a little bit of steam there as well so down around three tenths of a percent both for the nifty and the sensex but it seems as though the key problem currently lies within the mid cap space we'll do one thing we'll take forward um, a little more on the markets once we're back but as of now we need to take a break but